Hello, everyone. Um, today, I am joined by a, a returning guest. Um, I think I could give uh, Nicholas Kaufman here the keys to Jason's Weird Reads because <laughs> he's one of my favorite guests. Welcome back, Nick. Nick thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure, Jason. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking. I think this is the third time I've been on your show. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think your your regular viewers maybe know me pretty well by now. Yeah, and um, you're one of my more popular ones. I get comments oh. uh, whenever I I add your book to a list or whenever I discuss your books outside of talking to you. There's always one or two comments of like, when are you going to have Nick ba or Nicholas back on? Because uh, I love the weird science. I love his. Uh, <laughs> Laura Powell books. And... That's so nice to hear. I really appreciate you telling me that because, uh, you know, as you, as you know, as a, as a writer yourself, you never know how people are responding to your work unless they say something to you or, or it gets back yeah. to you. It can really feel sometimes like you're just putting your work out into the void and it just sort of disappears in a puff of smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's nice to hear that uh, there are people who are enjoying my work and, and, uh, oh, sure. and are looking forward to my, my books. Do you ever get like the, the blind email from a, a fan or a, a DM saying, hey, man, I really enjoy uh, what I have, you're doing? Yeah, I, probably about two or three times a year. Unfortunately, they almost all of them seem to be about my um, my urban fantasy books from St. Martin's, which are now out of print. <laughs> um, and they all say, well, how come there was never a third? And I have to tell them the sad story about how, yeah. um, you know, it was pitched as a trilogy. They only wanted two of the books and they wanted to see how it was going to do. And it didn't do well enough for them to want the third. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a sad story, but it's not um, a rare story. It, it happens quite a lot. Have you thought about uh, writing that third book and maybe just releasing it yourself? I do think about it sometimes, but then another part of me is like, let's just keep moving forward. You know, yeah. um, uh, the audience, I mean, aside from those people who write to me about it, who who loved the books, the audience wasn't that big. Uh, if it had, if it was big, it, it, this wouldn't have happened at all. And so I think I'd, I'd rather just sort of, and also for the sake of my sanity, I think I'd like to keep moving forward. Yeah, especially it being like the third book. It, I guess it would be kind of weird saying, here's the third book. I released it myself and then it doesn't sell. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I have the rights back to the first two now, so I could release all of them together. Oh, well, um, there you go, right? Which is, you know, it's something I'm thinking about, but I also like, part of me is like, moving forward might be a better option. We'll yeah. see. We'll see what happens. I never say never. Yeah. Uh, but it's been a few years and I feel like my my creative headspace is in a different place now than it was when I was writing those books. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to keep going forward too, but honestly, I don't think it's a terrible thing taking a step back to finish something. Yeah. That's just my yeah. opinion though. I haven't actually no, I, I don't agree. think I've heard of those books. Um Oh yeah, the, so it was uh the first one was called Dying is My Business and the second one was called Die and Stay Dead. Okay. Uh and the third one was going to be called uh, uh Only the Dead Sleep and it was about this guy who um he sort of doesn't really know who he is. He's got a bit of amnesia. Uh but and he's working for a crime boss and all he knows about himself is that he can't die or rather he can't stay dead. If he gets shot in the line of work, uh, what happens is the person who is physically closest to him at that time is actually the one who dies and he sort of resurrects. Um, and so he has to sort of be careful about that. Yeah. Uh, and then it sort of opens up into a world of, of, of uh, magic and mischief uh, in New York City. Uh, that the first sounds book, pretty cool, actually. I thank like, you. I like the the first book did okay. The second book was just greeted with indifference and, and didn't really sell at all so, so they're that, that's why I, i've never seen them listed on like amazon or i may have earlier on uh when i yeah. first started talking to you but i haven't recently yeah, so they're out of to, print I think if, and you if, have if you go to like my goodreads page I, they should be listed oh there. they're probably there yeah yeah you know i'm terrible i should really do more research on goodreads <laughs> um, that would that would give me more accurate information but i'm I don't know. I'm like a ro an Amazon robot that just automatically goes to Amazon. I don't get it, but <laughs> I guess I guess Goodreads is good is an okay place for for researching titles, but um, it's also been in the news lately as just sort of a bit of a toxic social media site. Mm -hmm. um, I still I still use it for to write my re own reviews of of other books I've read and to keep track of the things I'm reading, but um, I think I spend less time on there than I used to. Yeah. It's like uh, kind of like the way of Twitter, because <laughs> you you've recently left Twitter. Is that I did, correct? I yeah. did. You know, I I held out for as long as I could, 
I, I, I stopped using Twitter, but I kept my profile there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in the vain hope that maybe things would get good again over there or something. I don't know. But then after a while, I, was, I forget exactly what it was that was the last straw for me. It could have been any number of things. <clears throat> I actually think I remember, but I, I'm not going to mention it here, but it, it had to do with with uh, the Grand Master of Twitter and some of his uh, uh, anti-Semite uh, yeah. comments. And so you're just that like, point, that's it, that's it. <laughs> exactly. I don't blame it. At that point, I just I just nuked my account and I I didn't look back and I don't I don't miss it. Uh, I used to worry that I would that my social media reach was not going as far uh, mm -hmm. without Twitter. But I just saw an article recently about how the numbers on Twitter are so far down that I think maybe maybe I'm reaching more people on Blue Sky at this point, which is a weird thing to say. Yeah, but it's possible. Blue Sky is pretty interesting though. Uh, I think it can gain, gain traction. Honestly. I hope so. I hope so. It's, it seems like a fun, innocuous bulletin board type of social media. And we'll see if uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Now, I, I have a question here. It's a little bit uh, different than what we have just been talking about, but it kind of leads into uh, uh, what you've been writing recently and why we're here to talk. But I was wondering if you're a fan at all of the Alien franchise and if you've seen the new uh, uh, the new trailer for the new movie coming out. I am a fan of, of uh, Alien and Aliens. Um, I never really got into Alien 3 or Alien Resurrection, though I, 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 there are good parts to both of those movies. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Prometheus and Covenant, I, <laughs> I, I never really did anything for me. So yeah. the new one looks interesting. Um, it looks like it could be good. I've, I've got my fingers crossed. I like the director uh, mm -hmm. that they have for it. Um, it's going to take me a minute to get used to sort of these CGI face huggers yeah. sort of running around. But that's um, funny because I was just, I was just bitching about that oh, uh, yeah. to my wife <laughs> <laughs> today because I was like, have you seen the trailer? And she's like, no. And I'm like, well, I have my issues with it. And then I went into the CGI face huggers. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know what? It's just a trailer. The movie may not be like the special effects may not be completed yet or you never know. So I'll, I'm, I will reserve judgment until I see some reviews or, or even see it myself because I do like the world of Alien. I think the, those first two movies are are yeah. perfect. Like I, I couldn't I couldn't critique either one of them other than just to say that these are great movies. They're among my favorites. Um, Alien or sorry, Aliens was uh, one of the first movies I saw at the theater, at a drive-in theater at that, and that was really cool. <laughs> I mean, remember just being blown away by it. It was That's a great experience. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I am excited. We'll see what happens. You know, yeah, I, I've been, I mean, it might I've be been good, burned right? before, but Yeah. It might be good, who knows. But one of the things I love about the, those movies are is the con like it's very realistic in the way uh, the aliens reproduce and <clears throat> when I was talking about that movie today, that's when I added this question in because I'm like, you know, this book or that those movies kind of remind me of uh, the mind worms a little bit because there's that idea of uh, getting something, <laughs> a little egg or something yeah, planted being, uh, into you and then kind of bursting out. <laughs> right. And being sort of the host of a larval form of another uh, entity, another creature. Yeah. Um, I think... I can't remember where I read this or if I'm getting my facts wrong, but I think Dan O'Bannon, who wrote Alien, um, partially based it on his own uh, his own Crohn's disease, which was giving him a lot of stomach aches. Mm -hmm. But he was also fascinated, I think, by this idea of the parasitoid wasp, which sort of injects eggs into caterpillars, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, an important plot point in, in the mind worms as well. Um, and Very then that those... So. those uh, those larvae sort of develop within the caterpillar and, and, and <laughs> chew their way out. I think yeah. he, he read about that and was like, I want to make this into an alien movie. Yeah. And it works. And it also works really well in uh, the mind worms. This is terrifying things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I really, I, you know, as I was writing it, I was like, I think this is the most gruesome of the three books so far. It absolutely um, is. Like, there's no question. 
<laughs> oh man. Well, I've done it now. I've, I, you know, I meant for these to just be like science thrillers and I'm, I'm back in the horror field. Oh, you went deep <laughs> into the horror field. <laughs> I re I have, uh, in my notes here, I have Dahlia, dude. <laughs> surprising yeah. i wasn't expecting the gore yeah so dahlia mince is actually a holdover from the first book the the hungry earth yeah she was a minor character in that one and i made her a more of a, a central character in this one um but she's definitely bearing the scars of what happened mm -hmm. yeah. in that first book i mean in this in this book she's in a wheelchair she's lost both of her legs she has an eye patch um mm -hmm. she's not in good shape and she's very uh resentful about it because uh, as you know laura the main character got through it mostly unscathed and mm -hmm. Dahlia did not. So there's some, there's some tension there. Well, that's one thing though, is uh, Laura, she didn't escape it uh, completely whole. She, she has scars of her own, but they're more mental. They're kind yeah. of PTSD in a sense. And that's what Absolutely. I really en enjoy about this book is that uh, those plot lines from the first two books, they still haunt her. Uh, I've read series before where the previous uh, the previous books are almost never mentioned unless there's something important. But I like that you actually add this into lore. It's part of her now. And she's going to think about it because, I mean, she's going to think about what, <laughs> what happens in this book, too, a lot. I mean, it just keeps coming, right? Uh, but, thank but, you. Thank you for that. I mean, I I, uh, I noticed the same thing in series as well. And, and often also in a lot of the TV shows that I grew up watching, something, you know, there would be some big dramatic or terrible thing in an episode. And the next episode, the characters were back sort of reset back to zero. Yeah. You know, and I, and I feel like that's, that's not very realistic. And so, you know, in the second book, the, her and the whole town are still dealing with the effects of what happened in the first book. And in the third book, she's got the events of two previous books now sort of weighing on her. Mm -hmm. um, and she's seen a lot of stuff. She's seen a lot of death. She's seen a lot of misery and she's seen a lot of, weird science yeah <laughs> and she's haunted by it that, that's what i really enjoy because the for before things really kick off in this third book she's she's thinking about this stuff and like yeah. like when she meets up with dahlia she sees her physical scars and she feels bad she feels guilt absolutely um uh dahlia is I don't want to say Dahlia is a reflection of of um, of Laura because she's, it's not that much of a one to one ratio. Mm -hmm. But uh, what happened to Dahlia could just as easily have happened to to Laura, and in fact yeah. would have happened to Laura had the climax of that first book not gone the way it did. Yeah, <laughs> and she thinks about that. Um, but you know, um, that's the one thing I enjoy about your characters is they feel real from Booker Thank you. to uh, to Laura. Also, there's some new characters in this book, uh, Jordan uh, and and his uh, fiance, Nadim. Uh, that's uh, actually another uh, area I wanted to talk about. Um, sure. Is, uh, um, they're a gay couple and they're going to get married. And I think it was one of the more relaxed, like, coming from a, a white cis male uh middle-aged guy writing this it felt like the most natural that i've read and like there, Thank you. You, you weren't like how do i put this so it doesn't sound weird but you weren't like bashing us over the head with it it was just natural like this young couple in love i think relationships are relationships right so i mean yeah. there's there's no secret to writing uh there's no difference between writing a gay and a straight relationship, though they do sometimes have different hurdles they have to jump over. And sometimes mm -hmm. those hurdles are the same. Like in in uh, in the case of Jordan and Nadim, uh, Nadim's parents are very conservative. They're, they're conservative Muslims. They're, they're not really down with him marrying Ooh, A, yeah. another man, and B, a man who happens to also be Jewish. Um, so there's, you know, that, and that could happen in a straight relationship too, where it's like, They'd rather their child marry somebody within the faith. Certainly as a Jewish person myself, I, I felt that pressure from my own parents. Um, I'm not sure I would have necessarily bowed to that pressure, but I did wind up marrying someone who's Jewish anyway. Um, but I, that's, I think that's the secret to writing uh, any relationship is just like, they're just people. They're just yeah. regular people and they're dealing with their own stuff. Um, and uh yeah. So I, 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 so thank you. Thank you. I, 
I hope that um, that I made the gay relationship in the book as realistic and as loving and as um, uh, just as, as the as the straight relationships. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Um, there's there's contradictions um, about a white straight man uh, writing a gay uh, couple. There's going to be people who come to you and say, "Oh, you shouldn't do that because you're not gay." Uh, but then you have people like. Uh, Rath James White, who recently on TikTok said that you should have representation in your stories, whether you're that type of person or not. And you you can have them in any uh, form that you want, so long as they're there. Uh, and so what would you say to people who say that you shouldn't step out of your wheelhouse, that you should just write what you know? I would tell them that I understand where that sentiment comes from. Certainly, I've read my share of books from the 60s, 70s, even 80s where characters who are not heteronormative are just like ridiculous stereotypes or, and this, we saw this a lot in movies and TV too, where they're just, they're very flamboyant or they're stereotypes or they're what have you. Um, so I get it, I get it. And I, it's the same thing with writing about people from different ethnicities or backgrounds. Like I've seen it done so poorly. I understand where this feeling comes from. Like, like you know, just leave it alone if you're not from that community. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I do uh, I do agree with what Rath says. Like, I don't want to just write about middle aged white guys. <laughs> like, what what would be the point of that story? Um, so I will have to get into the minds of female characters, characters who aren't white, uh, characters who aren't straight, and all I can do is is my best to treat them as as humans, the yeah. same way I would treat any other character. I think that's the basic thing, right there, is to treat them as humans, right? Because we all, that's what we are, right? And yeah, I can't, I, I, just to clarify, I'm on the side of Wrath James White. I, I believe that it's okay to write this stuff, even if you're not, because yeah, we, I, I, I just... think it's, it's taking the stigma away and it's, uh, I think it's, it's helping to normalize things, but I, I, I agree. I, and I, I think it helps to just be sensitive as a writer, yeah. just be sensitive. I've had comments on my channel, though, of people saying, um, uh, I don't know why it seems some people would comment this on my channel, but they're like, uh, do you know of any books that aren't uh, woke and stuff like that? Because it seems like all books are woke. And I'm like, I don't even reply to those comments. You know, there's no there's you know, the, that comment is not actually asking you for book recommendations. Yeah. That comment is trying to make a statement about how they feel about things and who they are and stuff like that. It's not worth replying to, in my opinion. Yeah, and I don't. I'll leave the comment there, but I don't comment or give it a little heart or anything. Oh yeah, no, I think you should absolutely not delete those comments. I, yeah. I'm fully in favor of letting people hang themselves with their own rope. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, before we continue, uh, I do. I did pull up the picture of uh, because you were concerned you didn't have a physical copy yet. <laughs> I don't have I a copy of the, the book cover. physically, so I appreciate you having that. That's. It's another beautiful cover by David Dodd at Crossroad Press. Um, I've been so lucky with the covers um, that we've had for the Laura Powell books. And I love that yeah. they're all sort of, of of a sort. They're all sort of like, they all have the skull and like some sort of creature, <laughs> like natural this one, creature. This one looks and, like he's uh, he's been eating a little too much of the worms. <laughs> um yeah yeah so those are that's a skull with a hole in the head and some maggot like worms coming out and i, yeah. I can think of and i can think of no more evocative Im image i love the color scheme because well green Thank is you. one of my favorite colors the the screen isn't really picking up the how it's well very it green yes together. the first it's book was green. blue yeah. and the second yeah. book was purple this one is green and also green uh, just as a color is sort of um thematic also to the events of this uh yeah. book too because as things get worse for um for i don't want to give anything away for one of the characters uh he starts to s sweat uh, a green green colored sweat mm -hmm. um, which as it turns out uh is a real thing <laughs> that a real thing that happens i didn't That's... make up any of the science in this book just like i didn't make up any of the science in the others yeah, like, how did you come across this? Like, uh, the people sweating green. I, I, I would be both repulsed and impressed with myself in one way or another. It's called. It's a real uh, condition called chrome hydrosis, uh, and it has to do with certain um, 
I don't know if it's an enzyme or something in your sweat glands, but if you have this particular condition, your sweat has a color to it. It doesn't have to be green. It could actually be, it could be blue. It could be yellow. It could be red. Uh, it could be black or brown. Um, oh, I think red in particular would be very alarming. It would be it would very like alarming. Blood. Be like, oh, oh God, I got Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> right, or like, yeah. Um, but it's real. It's utterly harmless. But I think it, it, it people want to treat it because it is, for lack of a better word, gross <laughs> to have sweat mm -hmm. that's colored. Um, so, uh, when I found that out in my research, I was like, I got to use this, <laughs> I got to do something with this. Cause I wanted to give this character something more than just, you know, he, at that point in the, the book, he's going through certain things. He has this, he's having visions of worms and he says, he's got this increased hunger. Um, but I wanted there to be a, a, an outside physical, uh, manifestation of what he's going through as well. So I thought that this like strange colored sweat would just be really cool. It was really cool. I, I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and of course, I had to go look it up. That's the one thing I love about your books. I come across uh, something that happens. and I'm like, OK, I have to stop reading here so I can go look this up. <laughs> I like doing that myself. And I hope that the people who read these books will also enjoy doing that, too. Oh, um, I, I know that, that sometimes yeah. it can be difficult. I remember with the previous book, The Stone Serpent, you wanted to look up Stucky the dog. Which is a true story. <laughs> yeah, that was that was disturbing. And it was very disturbing. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's I mean that image is nightmare fuel. And the of this picture preserved yeah, dog clear. inside of a tree. Yeah, it's ter It's it's heartbreaking too. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the poor dog. Like you could tell it was stuck there, and it, an well, obviously lover. it died of uh, probably uh, dehydration. Exactly. But oh man, like just re remembering it, being fascinated and horrified at the same time. I know. So I, yeah. I, I, I do want people to to find these things in the books and be like, "Is this real?" And look <laughs> yeah. them up and be like, "Oh my gosh, it really is real." Yeah, like, I think that's a lot of fun. That is a lot of fun. Um, we do have a question, but before we get to that, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, one sure. more question about uh, about. Uh, symptoms because there is another really fascinating symptom that you talk about in this book and uh, can you explain what the lazarus sy sy uh, syndrome is for us because i was <laughs> like oh my god like it's another thing that's absolutely real uh there it's very rare i think there's only been something like 40 known cases of it in the decades since it was first um uh, talked about but this is a real thing where people are pronounced dead um and then hours later, we'll wake up in the morgue or yeah. or uh, a funeral home. And in fact, there's a, a story that I think took, took place in 2014. I want to say Long Island. I'm not entirely sure. Don't hold me to that. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, young woman goes to visit her grandmother, finds her unresponsive on the couch, uh, and then uh, calls, does what you do. You call the doctor or you call 911 or whoever. Yeah. Somebody comes and they said, you know, I'm so sorry. She's passed away. She's not responsive. There's no, there's no heartbeat. There's no breath. There's no reflexes, nothing. So her body is shipped to um, a funeral home. And thank goodness it went to a funeral home and not directly to a morgue for an autopsy because yeah. a few hours later, the workers at that funeral home like saw the body moving in the body bag, in the freezer. Oh, now, I got to tell you, if that were me, I would start running. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not stick around to find out what's happening with the body moving <laughs> in the body bag. I'd be like, oh, yeah. it's happening. It's the zombie <laughs> apocalypse. I'm out of here. But luckily, the folks at this funeral home were a lot uh, braver than I am. Yeah. Uh, and they unzipped it, and they found that she was alive. Oh, God. Um, and I feel... Uh, <laughs> Uh, protective of this woman because it's clear to me that she's also a member of the same tribe as I am because when they found her alive, the first thing she did was complain about how cold it was. <laughs> it's so cold. Why is it so cold? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are tons of stories of this and a lot of them, a few of them are, are quite recent. There was another one about a guy who woke up. He was not as lucky. He actually went to the morgue and he, mm. oh no, no, sorry. Um, he also went to a funeral home, but he woke up just before they started to uh, put um, formaldehyde into his body, oh, which would have certainly killed him. Yeah, uh, I mean, super lucky that he woke up when he did. That's, and they that's... still don't know. They still don't know what causes this. There are a number of theories yeah. um, that range anywhere from like 
uh, sort of like adrenaline drugs that are given to try to resuscitate people to CPR problems to all this stuff. But nobody knows for sure why or how these people were pronounced dead and regained consciousness hours later with apparently no no brain damage from it or anything like that. So they must have still been there must have still been some form of respiration. There must have been, yeah. Like some very form low of, of heartbeat, but, but it there, was yeah. undetectable. You know, um, this is one of my fears, honestly. I, one reason why I'm afraid of dying is waking up like during an autopsy or something. <laughs> and it, it was a short story by Stephen King that implanted that fear into me. And it was uh, Autopsy Room 4, mm -hmm. I believe from everything, Everything's Eventual. And so when I came across this in, in The Mind Worms... I, <laughs> I had to stop reading. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> like, no, not again. Because... It's rough. It's rough. Well, but luckily, uh, the, that character is also in a good situation where he wakes up before the autopsy really begins. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> given what happens later on to uh, this character that that happens to, I think I would have preferred to have gone through the autopsy and died. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think he feels the same way at one point yeah. in the book. He's like, she, I wish, you know. He he keeps wondering like why do I why aren't I dying why why yeah he does like, too, you know yeah. and, um, it's pretty you... sad actually is he's I don't consider him a villain he's really a, a victim as much as anyone else yeah but he's compelled to do some terrible things by by the condition that he has yeah and uh, one thing I really enjoyed about that is uh, uh, I don't want to go too far into it but you just mentioned uh, he he the character is compelled to do things that he doesn't want to and one thing that impressed me in your writing of it was how he's he's not blacking out during this he's there watching and he can't do anything to stop him he can't stop himself he's like and it's like it he's watching so himself well. from afar yeah it was done so well because you feel his agony as he's like what's going on like, yeah it was terrifying that yeah and also i mean it's it's something that I've never done. Obviously, I, I don't want to give too much away, but obviously, what, what we're talking about is that his his appetite uh, becomes so increased that he actually sort of becomes a cannibal. Yeah, um, uh, not sort of. He does become a cannibal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> um, and that's not something I've ever experienced. Or, or there's a scene where he's actually he's driven by this hunger, this unnatural hunger, to actually um, bite into the carcass of a deer that he yeah. finds in the forest. Oh, that and these was are gross. horrible, horrible things. Um, totally fun to write about, but they would be horrible to actually live through. Yeah. And so I wanted to capture that in his thoughts. Like, what would it be like to be so co compelled to do something that is so repulsive? It's still repulsive to him what he's doing, but he can't stop it. Yeah. And it was absolutely like, I th that kind of thing makes me gag. <laughs> and I almost had that, that, a response to that. There was another part actually where I had to stop reading and go, Oh my God. Like <laughs> I, I was going to, that was, uh, was like, that's what I should ask you. Like Nicholas, are you okay? <laughs> I tell you, man, I think this is the most gruesome of all three of those books. It absolutely is. It's, it's wonderful <laughs> though. I love it. I hope I, I, um, I mean, I obviously as somebody who cut his teeth writing horror, I love writing these gruesome scenes, but I hope they don't turn off uh too many readers no i don't think so well yeah i guess it could but um it should be stated that the first two books aren't nearly as gory as this one uh but this one is like it's a lot of fun um and there's there's some gruesome stuff in those first two books i mean there's yeah, there's but... <laughs> uh mushrooms popping people's eyes in the yeah. first book and then there's like i think there are bodies that melt into goo in the second book yeah but this book is just it goes for the super throat. gross yeah and that you know it appeals to me, and I think everyone on my channel, everyone who watches Jason, I would Weird imagine Reed, so. Kinda, I can't, I can't imagine there's anybody tuning into this channel yeah. being like, let's just see what kind of stuff we're talking about. Oh, they're going to appreciate it, I'm sure. <laughs> I I know, to, so. to switch gears a little bit, Leslie asks an interesting question. Nicholas, how do you feel about AI and publishing? Do you think AI should be used for books, including cover art? I'm not really in favor. Um, I, I would rather, I think there are so many more uh, useful applications for AI than mm -hmm. in uh, taking over the arts. Uh, I, I don't th I don't think we need books written by AI. Uh, I wouldn't want to necessarily read a book written by AI because no. AI doesn't have any uh, life experience to draw from. So it would just, it would be kind of a, 
I think it would be kind of an empty experience to read a, a book written by AI. I don't think there'd be any emotional resonance at all. Yeah. Um, and AI for cover art, no. I mean, um, not. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea either because, well, for one reason, um, AI art tends to just take what it finds online and, and make a few color changes or whatever. It's basically, um, I don't want to use inflammatory language, but I think it is basically theft. I think it's stealing art to make uh, a is. different kind of art. And the writing is too, because it also, it doesn't just analyze art and then reproduce that. It does the same thing with writing. Like there's a lawsuit going on right now. I forget who all's involved, uh, but they're, they're trying yeah. to stop it because they well, steal writers, uh, their voices and their style. It's not just that they're actually, uh, when, when they say that an AI program is um has been fed a thousand books or whatever to learn from what they mean is that those books have actually been scraped from online pirate sites so mm -hmm. these books are being used without copyright without permission yeah uh and it's it's uh it's unfair to the writers I, if you want to use my book or any other writer's book to train your ai program freaking buy a copy or ask for permission or something don't don't just take it from pirate sites online yeah, but uh, I would like to know where do you think AI is going in terms of writing books and uh, doing covers and stuff like that? Because it does seem like uh, no matter how much we sit here and no, um, I think I think it's going to have mm -hmm. some serious repercussions. Anyway, I think AI is here to stay. I mean, it's not it's not the genie's not going back in the bottle. Yeah. Um, which is why I also think it's important to have guardrails set up now while we still can uh, about mm -hmm. what AI can should and should not be used for. Um, but I know that uh, there are plenty of big publishers that are using AI to make cover art because it's mm -hmm. cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. They just they don't have to pay somebody to paint a picture. They can put in a they can just type in words uh, into a generator. Uh, and have the picture come up and then maybe the art director might do something to it or maybe not even that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. I hope that does not continue, but I don't see how it's not going to. I think anytime a, a, a company or a corporation finds a way to save money, uh, they're going to keep doing that. Um, they as for AI books, uh, I just don't know. Um, I used to be of the opinion that the first completely AI generated book from a major publisher would be an instant bestseller because people would just be curious. At the same time, yeah. uh, last year, Little Brown put out a book of poetry entirely AI generated. And I don't think it even made a blip. I don't hmm. think it, I don't think it was, uh, it made a splash at all. So I don't know. I'm not sure what the future really holds for that. Yeah. That's not surprising though, given that it's poetry, it would be interesting to see, uh, I don't want it to happen, but uh, there's been talk of like people generating a story, getting AI to write a novel for them, and then them, uh, the author, and I say that in quotations, uh, going <laughs> in and humanizing it. Um, it's you know it's possible, and we see AI generated a lot of its nonsense uh, books uh, just uploaded to Amazon to try to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. Right. So and so uh, Amazon is completely um, unprepared to deal with this, uh, but it's been happening more and more. And there's just there was, you know, speaking of uh, the hungry earth, there was recently a, a mushroom guide that was written entirely by AI and sold on Amazon. Wow. And it was telling people the wrong information. It was telling people that poisonous mushrooms were, in fact, fine to eat and stuff like that. And that's really dangerous. Yeah, that is very dangerous. So I, I don't know. Uh, it's. Uh, it's not a brave new world. It's a stupid new world that, that we're that we're entering with AI, at least in it the, is, in the yeah. terms of, of books. Absolutely. But I think um, there are other applications for AI that are amazing. I know that in the medical field, uh, AI has been able to um, identify certain kinds of cancer before human doctors are able to. And as hmm. you know, with cancer, like the sooner it's identified, the better for treatment. Yeah. So that's good stuff. That is good. I mean, I don't think AI is inherently evil. I just, I just feel like it doesn't have a place in the arts. I don't yeah. understand why it's even there. I have this uh, terrible idea of like the future being like this sort of dystopian where everyone who's alive 
works and that's it uh like our right to uh to create is taken from us because all that's going to through i or ai artificial intelligence is solely responsible for entertaining us and maybe doing other things that are good right but but yeah. because it's taken over everything here we are we all we get to do is just work work so that we can cons we can buy and consume the art yes. created by our computers right exactly oh my god that does sound like a dystopia but i know that the recent writer strike in hollywood had a lot to do with um not using ai to to write screenplays to like mm -hmm. continue to use humans to write screenplays and it was the same with the screen actors guild where they were like we do not want our likenesses captured by ai so that we appear in films that we never were actually in yeah but uh, it's i guess it, it'll all play out i don't think it's going to be quite the nightmare vision that i i mentioned but i think as you said it, it's here now and it's not going anywhere and i think what what will keep it from being the nightmare vision is if we have uh guardrails set up as as soon as possible to absolutely to keep ai where it's good and needed and keep it out of things that are gonna like cause people cost people jobs basically yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So Leslie says, thank you for entertaining my question. Of course, Leslie. It's a fascinating topic, and I could it probably is. talk for another hour about it. And I want to thank you, Leslie, for asking it. If anyone else has a question, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, uh, so I want to get back to uh, <clears throat> talking about the mind worms a little bit. Um, uh, in a recent Facebook post, you said that the paperback of the Mind Worms will only be available from Amazon. Did you want to expand on that just a bit? I don't know if I can because I'm not sure of the details here, but it seems right now that it's only available through Amazon. I don't know why entirely. Um, hopefully that won't be the case uh, forever. But at this very moment, Amazon is the only place where you can get the... Um, the paperback. Um, I don't think if you go to like if you go to your local bookstore and ask them to order it for you, I'm not sure right now they can do that, um, mm. and that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. And hopefully this will get rectified in some way soon. Hopefully, yeah. Um, one thing I enjoy doing is like following writers on social media because oftentimes they'll tell stories about what they're writing <laughs> and the struggles they go through. And I remember you talking about the process for writing the mind worms on a little bit on Facebook. And when you finally finished drafting it, uh, you, you mentioned on a post that uh, this one was tough. <laughs> so I'm wondering what, what were the challenges you, you faced while writing the mind worms? Uh, it wasn't so much the book itself, um, though there were, there were difficult parts to write because it's, like I said, it's, it's pretty gruesome and not everyone makes it out mm -hmm. alive. Um, but um, there was just some life stuff going on also that was just sort of like draining a lot of my time and energy. Um, yeah. I, I won't get into all of it. It's not, it's not terrible stuff or anything. Uh, just, you know, I was, I was court appointed administrator for my late great aunt's estate. And mm. that took a lot of work and a lot of time and a whole lot of frustration. Yeah. So I didn't get uh, as much writing time as I normally would have. And what writing time I did have I was kind of low. I I didn't have the energy to really keep at it. Uh, so this one actually took, whereas the other books, the other two books took me about half a year or so to write each mm -hmm. um, from start to, to final version. Um, this one took me a little over a year because I just didn't have the energy or the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and so that made it difficult. Um, but uh, I'm glad it's done. I'm glad it's out there. Uh, I hope it's finding its audience. Uh, I hope it will have been worth all the heartache. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a it, like I keep saying, it was a great book. Uh, I think it might be my favorite of the series. Really? So yeah. Oh, thank you. That's good to hear. I appreciate that. You know, I think maybe I have a real uh, a better handle on the characters and the world that they live in now, th three books in, than mm -hmm. maybe I was still sort of trying trying to find on those first two books. Yeah, I think you do. Um, the, the characters are definitely taking shape, Booker and, and Laura especially. Um, do you find, like, like when you talk to guys like me, though, who just, like, compliment the book to death, uh, d does that haunt you when you, like, oh, God, like, when you're going into the next book, you're like, oh, how am I going to, how am I going to keep this going? Sometimes. Uh, it's, it's, every, every time I start a new project, a new writing project, 
there's this part of me that's like, what if I don't have it anymore? Like, what if I've lost the ability to write? Mm -hmm. Because first, you know, writing that first rough draft of a book can be a real chore, can be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, no, you know, nothing is quite, nothing feels quite right. You know that some of the word choices you used are not the best. Characters might be acting out of character. Um, and it's hard not to feel uh, sort of depressed about that or frustrated by that. But yeah. I just keep trying to remind myself, it's just the first draft. You know, I usually go through three to four drafts on these things. Uh, and by, by certainly by the second or third draft, everything's feeling a lot better. Awesome. What do you do when you hit a wall? Like uh, maybe you wrote yourself into a corner um, and you feel like you can't get out of that corner. Um, well, one, th one thing I try to do is, is step away from the computer because just staring at a blinking cursor is not going to help me get any writing done. And yeah. neither is just, you know, immediately going to YouTube or looking up <laughs> social media or whatever. Yeah. It's not going to help. Um, what, what does need to happen is to give my brain a minute to think about why I'm stuck. Is it because something is happening that that doesn't feel right or doesn't fit? Is somebody acting out of character and that's tripping me up? Something like that. And usually, this is actually true of a lot of writers, it comes to me in the shower. Mm. <laughs> because in the shower, you're just you're 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 not really thinking about anything, right? You're just yeah. you're just sort of operating, you're you're washing yourself sort of on autopilot. Um, and I also think that you're just sort of more open because you're just you're in a shower and there's nice hot water and that you're feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's often when the idea, the solution will come to me in the shower. And then I jump out of the shower. Like, I wish I had a pen and paper right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, you're not the first to, to say that I've, I've heard the shower before. I, I think I might be an alien and that ideas never come to me when I'm in the shower. Um, I don't know why that is, but ideas come to me. Uh, typically when I'm taking a walk or something like that, or. Yeah. I think it's a similar principle. You know, yeah. you're, you're just not, you're, there's, there's no pressure on your mind. So it's able to sort of sort through everything it needs to sort through. Yeah. Like, there have definitely been times in the shower where I realize I just wrote a scene um, that's all dialogue and the dial. And I realize in the shower, Oh, that dialogue's all wrong. Like it, I can, I can pare this conversation down to like, you know, three paragraphs instead of six or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I find those moments invaluable. And I, I, I uh, and I, I know that other writers have the shower thing too, because I, I have a very good friend, uh, John Foster. He's a horror writer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and he actually has a waterproof whiteboard in his shower <laughs> that he'll write <laughs> his awesome. ideas down on. <laughs> you got to wonder what guests might think of that if it's not like his own private <laughs> what are you like, wait, there's a whiteboard in your shower you know that <laughs> yeah and he's written on it like you know blood guts <laughs> okay i gotta kill wendy next <laughs> <laughs> yeah how to kill wendy question mark <laughs> and what do i do with the body like, oh my god oh did you see you didn't see that did you as you wipe it off <laughs> possible body hiding locations a the park b the cellar research body disposal <laughs> <laughs> so i gotta tell you I've, I've thought about also getting a whiteboard for the shower just for those moments when when inspiration strikes you totally should especially after uh, the funny parts here that happen <laughs> you can freak out <laughs> freak out your guests with it <laughs> <laughs> or i just write on it look behind you or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. oh man okay let's uh i want to talk just a little bit about uh uh, parasitoid wasps because that's a big part of this book and I, I put in my notes here man that sounds like a death metal band the parasitoid wasps <laughs> <laughs> i can even see the artwork for this oh yeah definitely oh yeah so this is these are wasps are jerks there's yeah. no getting around it wasps are the jerks of the natural world they certainly are and there are certain species of wasp that lay their eggs inside of caterpillars which is just in its in itself disgusting Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but what fascinated me about this is that those, the larvae that hatch inside the caterpillars, they'll start to eat and drink its blood, but they're not like drinking too much of the blood and they're not eating too much. They're like, stay away from like the important organs and stuff. Cause they actually aren't interested in killing the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Like the cat, they have, per they have a purpose for the caterpillar and they don't want to kill it off. There are certain 
um, parasites that will just like eat their way through the caterpillar. But these particular ones for the parasitoid wasp, they they just hang out inside it and they make the caterpillar um, ravenously hungry so that it's mm -hmm. sort of, it's continue, continuing to eat so that it's continuing to regenerate flesh inside so that the <laughs> the larvae can continue to eat that flesh. Yeah. And then this is, and this part blew my mind when the time comes for them to to come out of the caterpillar, they will actually chew their way out, um, which is which sounds horrible. Uh, they I think they secrete some sort of chemical that paralyzes the caterpillar, and then they chew their way out. But as they're doing this, they don't spill a single drop of caterpillar blood, mm -hmm. which is like what? How is this even possible? Because yeah. they're chewing their way out. But there's um, something interesting that happens after uh, they chew their way out. The uh, caterpillar stays with them. and the, Yeah, the and caterpillar, which them. has no maternal instinct whatsoever and is now free of the larvae, will actually stick around and help them build their uh, cocoons with its, own, um, with its own silk. And then will stay and protect the cocoons from predators until the wasps emerge. Uh, it's fascinating, and they still actually don't know exactly why the caterpillar does this. But one theory is that uh, one or two of those wasp larvae stay behind inside the caterpillar mm -hmm. and basically puppet it, like like they act like a puppeteer, and they just they make the caterpillar do things. It's horrifying. It's, horrifying. it's very horrifying. Like I don't want to give anything away in the book, but this this sort of thing kind of happens in the book yeah. and, and it's terrifying it's absolutely terrifying i think th this actually reminds me a little bit of uh um uh possession stories in a sense because uh, i think that's why one reason why possession stories can be so terrifying is because uh a total loss of control and yet absolutely in this book uh the victims are uh they're sort of forced to watch everything that happens and they're there and they're yeah, it's, it's very much like a possession story in that in that same way like you are your body is being controlled by another entity another consciousness um and that's that's terrifying to me as well in fact i i realized that uh in a lot of my work this is a recurring theme of of your body you know be, being taken over by someone yeah. else um so i guess it's just that must be really you know yeah, a deep-seated fear for me. You dealt with this quite extensively in the Hungry Earth, the first book. Yes, uh, that was sort of that was more of a that was a fungal intelligence, mm -hmm. and this one is an insect intelligence, and they have very different uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the fungal intelligence is really just interested in spreading and reproducing, uh, and an insect intelligence is like I need to eat because, uh, as you may know, wasps are carnivores, mm -hmm. uh, and so they need meat. Um, and so it's just, ugh, I'm giving myself shivers. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not something that, um, it was fun to write about. I would never in a million years want it to uh, actually happen to anybody. No, no. I mean, you could see how this could become another epidemic on its own. Like near the end of the book, I was like, my God, like this could, this this could be like just imagine if this was a post-apocalyptic novel. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is um, our... Uh, immune systems as human beings are so complex that there's no way a wasp could lay its eggs inside of us and those eggs would would come, survive. Would, would, would survive. Yeah. Um, but in but, something uh, like a caterpillar, um, the, the wasp will inject something called a poly DNA virus mm -hmm. that sort of uh, turns off its immune system uh, so that the eggs do survive. But our their their immune system is so much less complex than our own that mm -hmm. even with that poly DNA virus, I don't think the eggs would survive inside of humans. No, but it, it's freaky to think that it could and and that it would like happen so much that it would cause the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leslie says, and and as if I need another reason to hate wasps. And no, you know, you're not alone. Uh, all I, the research I did on wasps, there was not a single thing I learned that made me change my mind about wasps. No. Not, I, not I, one thing made me like them. I actually have a scar on my face from a wasp. Um, really? Yeah, I was opening up. I, I didn't know that this wasp was in there, in, in the shed. 
And I was like 14 years old and I was going into the shed to get my bike because I was going out somewhere. The mm-hmm. second I opened it up, a wasp came right out and got me right in the face. There's a little oh bump. God. I don't think the camera can pick it up, but there's like oh a little bump there. Uh, but, to this oh very my... day. I mean, that's years ago. Yeah. I, like my whole face like swelled up from that. And I've hated wasps with a passion ever since. I like honeybees. They're fine. They're, yeah. They they have a purpose, but exactly. it's like wasps. Can we not just get rid of them? <laughs> I'm not even sure wasps uh, do much in the way of uh, pollination. So like bees no, serve a purpose. So. Wasps yeah. are just jerks. I think they're just meant to like keep populations of certain things <laughs> under control. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nature nature can be pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, but uh, going back to the fungal thing. Um, I was thinking about this while you were talking about uh, fungal like intelligence in that they found intelligence uh, that trees, <laughs> I don't know if you've probably heard about this, that trees they think are, are somewhat conscious now and they communicate to each other and they use fungi to communicate to each other. And yeah. I read yeah, this fungi recently. are like the, the phone lines of the forest. Yeah, right? I was like absolutely fascinated by this. And I thought of the hungry earth when I was reading yeah. it. It's called yeah. the mycelial network, and it's this the the fungi are actually just uh, the these um, filaments underground. Like when you see a mushroom, that's just sort of the that's basically the fungus is genitals, uh, so that it can <laughs> spread its spores around. But the real form of a fungus is just these filaments underground called called hyphae, mm-hmm. um, and or, uh, they create what's called the mycelial network or the wood wide web, um, and they connect. The roots of, of trees. Uh, it's basically a form of of uh, trade, like the tree and the fungus are trading nutrients. Mm-hmm. But the fungus can also act as like a, a a communication device between parts of the forest. So if there, a forest fire breaks out on one end of a forest, and it's the same mycelial network going under the whole thing, the trees on the other side will will uh, be aware of the fire in the way that, however, trees are aware, mm-hmm. uh, and and do whatever trees do to protect themselves, whether it's roll up their leaves or or what have you. Um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. It is and, fascinating. And fungus is so weird because it's like it doesn't have a it doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't have a brain. Mm-hmm. But there are so many. Uh, things that we can point to that that seem to indicate intelligence, not intelligence like you and I have, not a human intelligence. Yeah. But I do think um, it might be time for us to sort of redefine intelligence beyond what we think of as human intelligence. Because, and consciousness. Uh, yeah, because I, I think it exists in other life forms, uh, just not in a way that is the same as ours. Yeah. Now, all these uh, awesome science facts and weird, weird science, uh, weird science uh is fascinating but if people want to continue to learn about weird science they can do so with you now because you've started your own podcast yes uh it hasn't launched yet it's actually launching on april 1st mm-hmm. uh, i realized that that's april fool's day but this is real this is not a joke <laughs> yes, I, I, I saw that and i was going to ask you about that because it's real it's real um <laughs> Uh, it's me. I'm co-hosting it with my friend David Wellington, who's also a horror and science fiction writer. Yeah. And together we realized that we have this, not just a love of strange, but true science, but we've done so much research for our books, including research we can't use. Because whenever you research something, you're going to, you know, 75% of it winds up not in the book. Um, but we love to talk about this stuff. So we created, we're doing this podcast. It's called Spooky Science Lab. It's mm-hmm. going to be everywhere uh, you get your podcasts on uh, April 1st. We actually, um, I think we have about seven episodes in the can now. Cool. Uh, <laughs> in the can. It's on a hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of a can. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the first season is going to be about 12 episodes. So we have half of it already recorded. Awesome. And you said each it, episode uh... is, is uh, two like two weird science facts. So like I, I tend to talk about the natural world, like things like, you know, parasitoid wasps and fungus and stuff. And he talks about outer space stuff. Ooh, nice. And there's so much weird stuff in outer oh, space. I've, space it's, is it's, terrifying. It's mind boggling. We, we have, there's no shortage of weird science either for earth or outer space. 
I'm going to love this show because I love weird science, natural stuff here on Earth, but I'm a huge fan of like uh, uh, space. Oh, yeah. I love learning about space and uh, like the size that black holes can get to is just mind boggling, like terrifyingly mind boggling. Yeah, they can be huge or they can be tiny. He was yeah. in a recent episode, he was mentioning microscopic sized black holes, which may be the basis of dark matter. And how just how weird that is, and 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 actually kind of how dangerous it is. Yeah, um, I think one of the I think it was in the episode where he talked. He asks the question, "What if there's a black hole inside of our sun?" I've heard that theory. Yeah. Um, well, it's not really a theory. They don't think that our sun has one. There's no way but, to know until it's too late. <laughs> yeah, but they they do <laughs> think that other stars have mm -hmm. tiny black holes in the middle of them, and that's just like me, you know, like. That's just weird because yeah. you would, I don't know, man. It, I... <laughs> there's a, there's a point in space as particularly a, a point in the depth of a black hole where all laws of physics stop mm -hmm. and people just, and scientists cannot use math to figure out what's happening in there because it yeah. just, it doesn't apply anymore. So it's, there's something going on in these, in the center of these black holes that we just can't even comprehend. Yeah. And black holes are fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've read books on them, and most of it's like whew, right over my head because they're they're speaking googly doc, and <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> that. But but, but they're yeah. terrifying. They're terrifying yeah. phenomenon because nothing can escape them. Yeah. Um, and there's this idea, you know, there's I'm not sure how realistic it is, or if it's just hopeful that there's this idea that black holes are actually wormholes that go someplace else, maybe another universe or something. Yeah. Um, I don't, but I honestly, don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that's it myself. I think it's, it's just mass that's been crushed to such a density that, uh, and it's spinning so fast, but it's mostly that mass that's been crushed so small. They, they say that like if the earth was to become a black hole, it would be like the size of a grain of sand or something like that. Right. Now, but it just, would have the same mass as the planet. Yeah, so like the gravity imagine, would be incredible. Yeah. Just imagine the earth being crushed into that size and because of the gravity and all that, um, that's where it gets its power from, right? And, so much, so much weird science in the yeah. world and in outer space. Yeah. So I am very much looking to this podcast. I can't wait. Now you Thank mentioned you. Uh, Leslie here. She said that she's excited about the podcast as well. Thank so Leslie. yeah, uh, it's, it's, so once again, it's called, uh, oh, I had it here in my notes. Spooky Science Lab. That's it. Yes. And it's, it's I can't premiering. tell you how long it took us to come up with a name. Spooky Science Lab. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned that it's going to be in seasons. So yeah. what what are the seasons going to run and how many episodes do you think will be? We're thinking the first season is going to be, which starts on April 1st, is going to be 12 episodes or maybe 10, probably mm -hmm. 12. Um, and uh, we'll probably do two seasons a year. So we'll see. We'll see how okay. it goes. Cool. It's all very contingent on how this first season does. So I hope folks will tune in and like and subscribe and do all those things that you're supposed to do with podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll I'll talk about it on uh, my show here because, Appreciate like I that. said, I'm I'm obsessed with this type of stuff, and and I love learning uh, more about it. Right. So yeah, it's just food for thought. Like, and by the way, so if fun. you or any of your viewers or listeners. Uh, have any weird science topics that you'd like for us to look into and maybe talk about on the podcast, you can reach out to us at contact at spookysciencelab.com. Okay. That's um, the email. Let me write that down. Yeah. Contact. That's contact at spookysciencelab.com. Contact. At... And uh, people will also, I'm sure, be sending us corrections to that email also because we're not scientists we say that at the beginning of every episode we're not scientists we just love strange but true science facts so it's it's quite possible we get some details wrong yeah now do you think that you could ever veer into the area where you have like a uh, uh, scientists come on the show to discuss certain topics with maybe I, we, we have been discussing uh having guests but right now we're, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible because we're still learning Mm -hmm. how to do a podcast we've never done a podcast before either one of us yeah um so but in the future perhaps in another season we'll have guests on like scientists and stuff awesome now before we go i have to know if you're working or plan on working at all on the next dr laura powell book book number four 
uh, I could write these Dr. Laura Powell books uh, until my final days, but it depends on how this book does. This is book number three in the series. Mm -hmm. um, book number one did very, very well and was an Amazon and Barnes and Noble surprise bestseller. Mm -hmm. uh, book number two didn't do as well. Uh, so we're hoping if, if this book trends back up, we'll keep that series going. Uh, if it doesn't do very well, it may not continue. We'll have to see. Well, I'm hoping that it does continue to do very well because Thank I'm you. really enjoying the series and I want to see what weird stuff that uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Laura Powell and, uh, and, and friends are going to have to solve next. You know, there's, there's a, um, there's one sort of strange earth creature <laughs> that I keep wanting to do something with, mm -hmm. uh, with this series, but I just don't know yet. It's the, um, it's the Portuguese man of war, which I'm sure you've heard about mm -hmm. or heard of, but what's so interesting about it is that it's actually not a single organism. It's a bunch of separate organisms working together to become sort of more than the sum of its parts. I'm fascinated by this, but I don't know what to do with it yet. <laughs> yeah. Do you have an idea for book number four? Is this like maybe a hint of where it might go? If you, I don't know yet. <laughs> you know, I uh, it takes me a while usually after I finish a book uh -huh. uh, to get back into that headspace of writing another one. Yeah. So I think right now I'm in more in sort of the spot where I'm refilling the creative well rather than than writing a new one yet. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping to see more, and I'm sure a lot of my uh, viewers. Uh, want to as well because like I said I you're one of the only authors there's a couple others but you're one of the only authors that where people will come out and comment about your work that's so especially, sweet especially these books uh, they're like oh. I can't think of anything specific but I've gotten more than like just a two or three well uh, comments. I hope it's all good and they're not like oh yeah you know. it's all good I've never heard anything <laughs> bad like I, I do get those negative comments but never about your stuff it's usually oh. about me <laughs> or something I've done. <laughs> I don't understand why people write comments like that. I really don't get it. Oh, thankfully I don't get too many, but I've gotten <laughs> my fair share, I think. <laughs> it comes with being a public figure, I guess. I guess so. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming on and uh, talking some weird science with us. Uh, before we go, I do want to mention that you don't have to read these books in order. Um, yeah. Book three here, I would urge you maybe to go read first, especially if you're into horror because this book really, like I, I, I've said, it goes for the throat, man. It, it goes hard, yeah. Yeah, it goes hard. And <laughs> and I think it would be a great way to introduce yourself to this series being a Thank horror you. fan. Because, uh, but like I said, you don't have to read them in order because everything you need to know, uh, it's it's nothing's confusing. I, I, I get reminded of what happened in the other books. Yeah, the, it's uh, they're all pretty, they all stand alone pretty well. And, and if there are, is something that you need to know from a previous book it is placed within that context yeah exactly and uh, then you can go read the other books uh, and catch up <laughs> thank you for having me on jason yeah thanks for coming and uh, next next time you're always welcome back um, you thank do, you, so you do have the keys to the jason's weird reads uh, kingdom now so <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to thank everyone who uh, came out and I especially want to thank Leslie for asking questions and coming. Thank you for your questions, Leslie. And uh, thank you again, Nick, for coming on and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.